please remain standing um, as I read, we read the word of the Lord together, understanding that it, it's, it's an odd text to jump from what we just had into this, but trust me, by the end of this message, it will all come together, okay? So Revelation 13, starting with verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. <clears throat> it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, great rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has this mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Anybody want my job this morning? <laughs> this should be fun. The CEO of Monster Energy Drink probably wants my job this morning. If you don't get that, that's good. Um, before, before I jump into this, which I'm terribly excited about, let me first congratulate one of our own, one of our own elders, Mr. Roger Ganim, who served our church so faithfully. He's not resigning as an elder. His term is up in January, which I'm crushed over. Um, but Roger has been serving as an attorney. They moved, him, him and his family moved here um, years ago to work as an attorney for Liberty Council. And he got the nod, he got the phone call this week that he is now the sixth district court of appeals your honor, Judge Roger Gannam, which is awesome. So they have a huge mammoth week. Bella is leaving for Florida State University. They've moved into a new house, and now Bella has to call her dad your honor. So there, there's all of that going on. Um, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm thrilled for Roger. I'm sad for us. He can't, once he's in that position, he can no longer give us legal advice. So I'm just going to have to work with Wikipedia and hope, that, hope for the best. When we, when we need that. Okay, y'all excited? You nervous? 666, six, six, we got this number out there. It's like, what, what, what do we do with that? Listen, eight months into this sermon series or this mammoth study on the book of Revelation, we're eight months in. Today is sermon, individual sermon number 26 of 37-ish that we're doing, but today is number 26. 26 sermons in, eight months in, and we are finally at the very part of Revelation that it is known for. You might not know anything about Revelation, but the entire world, whether believer, follower of Christ, or not a follower of Christ, they all know the mark of the beast for whatever reason. For whatever reason, the number 666 stands out. A matter of fact, some of you guys are getting nervous right now that I'm saying that in a church. Are you allowed to say that number? It is, what are we invoking when we do that? Well, hopefully we can relax and understand that God is going to do something. Now, we, we all know this number. We might not understand entirely what it means, but we have a familiarity with it. What, what does it mean? Did you know that there's an actual phobia over this particular number? There are people who struggle with it. There's a name for it. Check out this name. I had to write it out so I can, it, we'll throw it up on screen. It's hexacosio, hexaconta, hexaphobia. Okay, so it's the fear of the number 666. If you can read into it, you see that the number or the, the word hexa is repeated three times because hexa is, I think it's Latin for, for the number six. So when you invoke a hex on somebody, you're invoking a six on them. I don't know what that means for a judge that is going into the sixth district <laughs> court of appeals. We'll, we'll deal with that in, in, in a moment. We'll figure that out. But, but there's the six in all of this. So here, here's, here's where we're going. What is the mark of the beast? What in the world does it mean? Is there satanic power in this number? Will people have it stamped on their forehead or and or their right hand? And will people need it to buy groceries after the rapture of Jesus Christ? Okay, so we're gonna talk through all of that. But in order to get there, which I'm excited, I can't wait to get there because once we unveil biblically what we think this means, what was being interpreted in Revelation 13, um, we, we've got some groundwork to cover. 
We need to understand what this beast is all about, what's going on here in Revelation, especially if you're brand new. Again, every single week, if you're brand new with us and you're jumping into the middle, middle two-thirds, the second part of our study in the book of Revelation, you're like, do these guys believe in dragons? Like when we go out to our car after we're done, is there going to be a fire-breathing dragon out there waiting to destroy us with a 666 stamp on his chest? Like we don't believe in a literal dragon, but we do believe in a literal enemy that this dragon points to who is Satan, the enemy of our savior. So it's all symbolism. This is a lot of symbolism going on and imagery going on in the book of Revelation. So we need to understand that. Now, in order to make sense of what happens at the end of Revelation 13 with the mark of the beast and this number 666, we gotta lay some groundwork. And one of the things I wanna bring to your attention is that as we've walked through this text for eight months, Eight months, the text and me together have been laying the groundwork for today and you didn't know it. There, there's a subliminal message or a subliminal preparation that's been in place just for today and I think you're going to see it in just a moment. Now to get there, let's rewind to Revelation chapter 12, one chapter before Revelation 13 and we're introduced to these three characters. There's a woman, there's a dragon, there's a child. We've spent four weeks talking about this particular section of scripture. Now, two of these three characters that we're introduced to, the woman and the dragon, are signs. They point to something. The dragon points to Satan. The woman points to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and ultimately the people of God. But the child is not a symbol. The child is Jesus at Christmas morning, growing up to be our resurrected, crucified and resurrected Savior. So in Revelation 12, we're introduced to these characters, and what we find out is that this dragon, Satan, hates Jesus. He wants to rise above God. He wants to take his place. And so we're presented with the story of Christmas morning almost through the eyes of Matthew's gospel, whereas Mary is giving birth to baby Jesus, this dragon, this imagery is there of Satan waiting at the womb trying to destroy this baby because he knows if Jesus gets out and the plans of God are accomplished through Jesus, that Satan is doomed. Satan knows the gospel. Satan knows the scriptures. He knows that if Jesus has, or God the Father has his way with Jesus's life, that Satan is ultimately doomed. So he tries to kill this baby before this baby is born. This is the story we find in Matthew and his gospel account of the Christmas story. He doesn't succeed, right? Jesus is born. Jesus' family goes to Egypt to avoid all of the stuff that Herod and Satan working through Herod is trying to play out. None of it succeeds. Satan fails again later on in Jesus' life when Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He can't get Jesus to fall. He can't trip Jesus up. The one time Satan does think that he has Jesus defeated is Jesus is hanging on a cross. But of course, God uses all things together for his good. And the very cross that Satan thinks he has defeated God with is the very cross that Jesus purchased our redemption and our justification with. He can't beat Jesus. So the point of Revelation 12 is to show us that this, this dragon, this Satan, is destroyed. He, he's once and for all lost the main battle, the main war. He can no longer touch Jesus. He's lost to Jesus on the cross, the resurrection of Jesus. He is lost. But there's this gap of time between the ascension of Jesus and his second coming where he comes to get his church and draw his church to himself. There's this time where Satan is still doing stuff on this planet. He's still doing stuff on this earth. So because he can't touch Jesus any longer, he's gonna go after that which matters the most to Jesus, which is us. Those of us created in the Imago Dei, the image of God, particularly his church. So when we look out at culture and we see all things, all hell seemingly break loose, we're like, what's up with that? And really the answer for this is that the dragon is still alive and the dragon is still calling some shots and he's still reaping destruction on humanity, okay? So th this is what's going on in that he's kind of like, I mentioned it last week, he's kind of like the Nazis in, at the end of World War II when Hitler had been, well, when he killed himself, when he's dead. And now all the Nazis with all the treasure that they had accumulated, they're like, you know what? If we can't have it, nobody can have it. And so they destroy it. This is what's going on with the dragon. If I can't have Jesus, I'm gonna hurt him where it counts. I'm going to go after his people. And so we need to be aware. Jesus is called a time out here in Revelation chapter 11, 12, 13, 14. He said, I want you to understand why it seems like evil is out there. I haven't abdicated my throne. I'm coming back. We just sang about it with him of heaven just a moment ago. There's a day coming 
where Jesus will make all things right and the devil will be done once and for all. But while we're on this period, and it's a grace period, it's a period where Jesus is trying to draw as many people as possible to himself in this era, this era we live in of the already but not yet. God's kingdom is already inaugurated, but it has not yet been consummated. So we're standing in, we're living in this tension-filled period where Jesus is drawing as many people to himself as he possibly can, while at the same time, the devil is trying to have his way with God's creation. Now, this is where it got interesting, is last week we're like, okay, a woman, a dragon, a child. That, that's kind of different, but then it got turned up 10 notches in chapter 13 because two more characters were introduced. Two beasts. We've got a dragon, and we've got a beast of the sea, and we've got a beast of the earth. And what we discovered last week is this is basically like a mob boss who has been imprisoned, the dragon, okay? Satan at at the cross lost the ultimate war. He's kind of been restricted to a sense, but he still has a voice on the outside of prison. He's got these minions doing his dirty work for him, this beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. Last week, we unpacked what the beast of the sea is, the beast of the sea. Long story short, the beast of the sea at the end of the day represents nations who have walked out of the umbrella, the protection, the holiness of our God and tried to become gods themselves. So it's political systems, it's nations who have rebelled against God. This is what the beast of the sea represents. Now remember, the dragon, Satan, the beast of the sea, political powers, and now the beast of the earth that we'll unpack today, what are they? What is John or what's Jesus trying to get us to see when he talks about these three characters? They're mimicking something, aren't they? They're mimicking or echoing the Holy Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. So you've got the dragon who has the authority calling the shots. You've got the beast of the sea who is kind of mimicking Jesus Christ where the authority of the dragon has been given to him. And then you have the beast of the earth, which we're gonna talk about today, whose entire job is to point people to worship the beast of the sea, the political powers. In our trinity, in the real trinity, in the holy trinity, you got God the Father, the authority figure, who has given all authority on this earth to Jesus Christ the Son, and you've got the Holy Spirit, the third person of the trinity, pointing mankind to worship Jesus the Son. And over here, you've got the unholy trinity mimicking that. Remember, Satan can't create anything. He can't start anything on his own. All he can do is copy, pretend what is real. And he's trying to get mankind to believe in that which isn't real, to fall for the fake. So that's what's going on here in all of this. Again, last week we talked about the beast of the sea. I get tongue-tied sometimes, but the beast of the sea, political powers, nations that are rebelled against God. Now, today we talk about the beast of the earth. This is the beast that you're probably most familiar with, but at the same time, we have misunderstood the most. Who is or what is the beast of the earth and what is his purpose at the end of the day? Let's make it very simple. Let's just cut to the chase. The simple answer, the role of the beast of the earth is to deceive through signs and wonders. He's a witness pointing people, making people believe that the beast of the sea, the one who represents political parties and nations that have rebelled against God, he wants people to believe that that is who we are supposed to worship. So last week we discovered, we unpacked the beast of the sea who is desiring our worship. And now the beast of the earth is compelling us to worship the beast that we talked about last week. At the end of the day, this isn't about political powers. This isn't just about Republicans and Democrats or which country is best, which ruler rules. At the end of the day, the job of the beast is to deceive to make us worship anything or anyone that isn't God. And the easiest thing to trip us up with is power and authority. So this is why he's pointing towards that. So remember, he's mimicking this beast, the beast of the earth, is doing these miraculous signs, trying to get us to believe that that second beast is who we're supposed to worship, the same way the Holy Spirit will allow signs and wonders to be done so that we will worship the Son. Remember in John 16, right, right as Jesus is getting the, the disciples prepared for his departure, in there's the high priestly prayer, there's a whole bunch going on, but he explains the Spirit's role in the life of the church. He says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears from the Father, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
okay? So the beast of the earth is going to perform all these signs and wonders, mimicking the Holy Spirit to get people to worship the beast of the sea, and he's going to do whatever it takes to manipulate people into trusting and following political powers or any other thing to get us distracted and move out from the blessing of God. So if the beast of the sea represents political powers, what in the world does the beast of the earth represent? What does he represent? If the first one is political powers, what is the second one? At the end of the day, when we look at Revelation 16, 19, 20, which we'll look at later, what we find out is the second beast actually has a title, and he's called a false prophet. So think about this. If the, if the beast of the sea is a dragon-manipulated political power, the mob boss is calling the shots with the political power, then the, or the beast of the earth is dragon-Satan-manipulated religious power. So the beast of the sea is political power, which sounds incredibly dangerous, right? We're looking to our politicians, which Paul also tells us to submit to our authority figures. God has put them in position. But when they have twisted their authority into worship of self, then we've got to ask some questions, right? So the first beast, the beast of the sea, is dragon-manipulated political power. The beast of the earth is dragon-manipulated religious power. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go any further, which one's more dangerous? Political power out of God's control or religious power out of God's control? Which one does more damage? I submit to you that I think it's the religious power because the religious power not only is twisting things, but also pointing us to worship that thing that we shouldn't be worshiping. So we're going to talk through this today. This beast represents dragon-manipulated um, religious power. So here, here's what is going to go on. In, in Revelation 16, 19, and 20, this beast is labeled a false prophet. Have you ever heard that term, like a false prophet? What makes somebody a true prophet? What makes somebody a false prophet? What, here's the simple way to gauge that. A true pop prophet will always lead people to the worship of a living God, period. The, their audience, their material, everything they receive and everything they give is going to come from God and it's going to point God people to the living God. A false prophet, on their, on their hand, is going to lead people away from worshiping of the living God, doing everything they can to get us to worship someone or something else. Okay, and, I, I, and we'll talk more about this next week. I think when we think about Satan, we just have this Halloween Horror Nights impression of him, where everything satanic is going to be like, pentagrams and candles and, and gothic clothing, right? It's just going to be dark, and it's just going to be all this. But that's not the only weapon or tool. That, that's so obvious. That's so obviously demonic and satanic. But Satan's minions are, Satan's smarter than this. I don't need to come at them with pentagrams. What I need to do is convince them to worship something or someone else, and they won't even think or unpack that this is demonic in nature. I just need them to not worship the living and true God. That's where Satan attacks the most, and this is what this dragon is going to do. He's going to come in looking like beautiful religion, but at the end of the day, he's getting us to worship something that is not our living God. So false prophets share two things in common. I want to go through these things real quick. Then we're going to talk about 666. But in order to understand 666, you need to understand that this beast is a false prophet. False prophets bring people away from the worship of a living God, and they have two things in common. Number one, false prophets take their cues from the way things are rather than the way things ought to be. When I'm preparing my sermons, there's always one part that I'm like, this one I've got to take my time in because it stumps me. My brain doesn't work quickly enough. I know I'm speaking 1,000 miles an hour. I'll slow down, try to get this right. A false prophet operates from a place of where things are, not where things ought to be. Allow me to kind of unpack this for you. The ought to be is God's plan. This is the way life should be. This is the way culture should be. But a false prophet will look at culture and say, okay, it's broken. There's evil, there's chaos, there's disorder. So I'm going to lean into that and tell the world this is the way it's supposed to be. I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to say, listen, there's evil, there's chaos, there's brokenness here. And if you want it fixed, if you want it better, let me show you how it gets better. Let me point you to the other beast. Let me point you to the political powers that can fix this. Let me point you to the authorities that can fix this. Okay, so what this, at the end of the day, this is contextualization. It's reading an audience and leaning into the weakness of culture or leaning into the weakness 
of your particular audience. What are they struggling with? Now manipulate that against them. That's what a false prophet does. A true prophet sees the weakness and the sin of culture and points them to the way that it ought to be. This is God's plan. This is God's purpose for your life and the sin that you're dealing with, with your identity, with your relationships, with your finances. Rather than leaning into what culture says is true, we need to lean in what ought to be according to God's scripture. Now, contextualization, I'll be honest with you, contextualization for those that preach God's word is one of the most difficult things that we encounter every single Sunday. Like, preaching the gospel is super easy. Like, hey, here's the gospel. It's black and white, right? But my problem is every Sunday, I am preaching the gospel, which is standard and true, and it doesn't change. It's unchanging. It's unbending. It, it doesn't, it, it can't be, it can be manipulated. Hopefully, we're not manipulating it. But I'm preaching it to an audience where all of you guys come from different backgrounds, especially in Central Florida in 2023. We all have different ideologies. We have different upbringings. We were raised in different parts of the country or the world. And now you come here, and my job is to contextualize Scripture to where you're at. Does that make sense? makes me think, my, my wife and kids, they have a new thing to pick on me for. And it's my love for Little House on the Prairie. Any, anybody growing up, just Laura Ingalls and Manny, th- th- those were your people. Um, when when uh, Michael Landon died, one of the saddest days of our, some of you guys are like, Michael Landon died? Yeah, a while ago. Um, <laughs> some of you guys are like, what's Little House on the Prairie? Only the greatest show ever. Um, and it, I think it was such a great show for me because every day I got home from school, that's what was always, it was always on. And I looked at their world, and I'm like, what a time to be alive, right? They, they would eat dinner. Dinner, did, dinner didn't ever look good. It sounded good. It was, you could always hear them clinking the plate and Paul talking with his mouth. Open. It was just, it was fantastic. But anyways, did, by the way, there's a river, Melanie sent it to me. There's a riverboat cruise in Tampa with the living cast of Little House on the Prairie going to be there. I'm just saying, if you're looking for a pastor's appreciation gift... Just don't invite the pastor's wife. She has no... Zach, you want to go with me? You in? Little House on the Prairie? That's so cool. Here's the thing with Little House on the Prairie that always fascinates me. Like, we, we've grown up in an era that's different than any other era, where because of technology and how fast technology is changing, like, we are different from our parents, right? And our kids are different from us, and technology is changing. Not every 100 years, not every century, technology is changing the way in which we live, our fashion choices, the things we do, where we live, how we're raised about every six months, right? It's constantly changing. So I think about, you remember the chapel that they had that also doubled as the schoolhouse in Little House on the Prairie? Anybody remember the name of the pastor? I, I actually remember this. Anybody remember the name of the pastor? Reverend? Nobody? Reverend Alden. Reverend Alden. Here's a picture, a grainy picture of Reverend Alden. Do you, do you know how jealous I am of Reverend Alden? Everybody in his church was the same. They all dressed the same. Laura was going to grow up to do what Maude did, right? Albert's going to grow up to do what Pa did. The only difference is some had more money than the others. You have the Olsons with Nellie and Willie, right? And they were rich, but they still lived pretty much the same life contextually as everybody else in there. And so he had this job of contextualizing the gospel, but it had to be pretty easy because they were pretty homogenous. That's not the case here, right? And so think about it this way. Once upon a time in Walnut Grove, the little town of Little House on the Prairie, we could do trivia night, I'd destroy that. So in Walnut Grove, a false prophet came in. And I can't remember what happened to Reverend Alden, but he was out. And the fill-in pastor for him came in and started preaching a false gospel. Let me bring up who that false prophet was. Anybody recognize that man? That is Johnny Cash, ladies and gentlemen. How many of us knew that Johnny Cash should act, could act? So you can take that down because we're going to be distracted by it. But, but, but the contextualization is what I wanted to bring up. What, what, what a false prophet does, it says, okay, there's evil in the world. There's chaos in the world. Rather than calling the world to repentance in Jesus Christ, let's embrace the chaos. Let's embrace the chaos. Let's change the standard. Let's move the bar. And so we now preach what is out there rather than what ought to be. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to be careful with this because I know not all churches, and for, to a degree, when I was younger, I fell for this. But the seeker-sensitive movement over the last 30 years has done what? It said, okay, here's culture. Let's be like culture. 
Let's win people for Jesus by being like culture. Now, to a degree, there's some truth in that, isn't it? Because Paul himself says, to the Jew, I was a Jew. To the Greek, I was a Greek. I become all things to all people. But that doesn't mean that the gospel changes. We don't water down the gospel to reach the lost. The lost need to know that their only hope is in the truth of the gospel. But the false prophet will tickle the ears of culture and convince them what they're doing is not so bad, that God is being an unfair and unjust God to demand such allegiance to himself and to demand such change in our hearts. This is a warning sign of a prophet or of a false prophet. So hold on to that for a minute. The second thing that false prophets have in common, um, well, wait a minute, I wanna make sure I got all that. Okay, yep, we're good. Number two, false prophets advocate putting our trust in human powers and human institutions. So not only are they getting us to embrace culture, but they're advocating, hey, put your power, put your trust in the human powers and in these institutions. So the beast makes you believe that your only hope is in the power of the state. When chaos is abounding, when all of hell is breaking loose, we don't know what to do, we don't know where to turn. He's trying to convince us where to look. Don't look to the cross. Don't look to the throne room of heaven. Look to your political leaders. Look to the nation for your help. Listen, and this is where I want to be very careful, but very straightforward with you. Some of us are caught in the worship of the politician or the worship of the nations, and we call it patriotism. Now, listen, I I believe in patriotism. I think we should be thankful and grateful for the blessing of our nation. But when we cross that line of being a patriot to being a worshiper of that kingdom, all of a sudden we have fallen for the trap of the beast of the earth. That's his gimmick. That's his tool. That's his device, right? We need to vote accordingly. We need to represent accordingly to what our hearts and our conscious beliefs scripture is saying, absolutely. But the minute our trust and our faith and our hope is in the political powers of the day and not in the cross of Jesus Christ, we're worshiping the wrong, wrong thing. We're worshiping the beast instead of the lamb. And, and I think we would have to have our head in the sand. And I, I, 2020 was the hardest year for any church. I, believe, I don't know how any church could go through 2020 and say, that was awesome, let's have another, right? And it wasn't just COVID, it was also the politics of 2016 and 2020 in the presidential elections. And you can't tell me that there weren't Christians. I, Even pastors, especially pastors out there who were declaring their allegiance to political parties in front of their churches were worshiping a political party rather than the king on the cross. That's worshiping the beast of the earth. Man, I wish I had this stuff in 2020 because I absolutely would have preached this. But I didn't know. It was revelation. It was spooky at the time, right? But this is what the beast of the earth does. He wants us to worship, compels us to worship the beast of the state. Listen, for John, the problem isn't just that there's a false prophet on the loose. The problem is that there's false prophets on the loose in the church. So in the book of Revelation alone, remember when we did the seven letters to the seven churches back in Revelation chapter two and three? In chapter two, Jesus goes after the false prophets. Chapter two, Jesus commends the church in Ephesus for weeding out the false prophets that are in their midst. Also in chapter two, Jesus scolds the church in Pergamum for not dealing with two specific false prophets. And also in chapter two, Jesus scolds the church in Thyatira for not dealing with a false prophet who had the spirit of Jezebel on them. False prophets are a big deal in scripture. And if we don't see this at work during our own or in our own nation, then we've got our heads buried in the sand. The reason I'm trying to push this is I wanna see massive repentance among the people of God waking up to the reality that we're in, if you and I could honestly look at our hearts and recognize that our hearts are more bent towards the flag than they are the cross, then we've got to understand, listen, God's calling on us. This isn't God just saying, hey, you're going to heaven. It's nothing like that. It's God saying, hey, the conviction of the Holy Spirit is real. Who are you worshiping today? Which are you worshiping? Is it the flag or the cross. Okay, now all of that, all of that. What in the world does that have to do with 666? I am so glad you asked. Let's get to it. You ready? The mark of the beast. Now, some of you are like, okay, now I'll pay attention. Cool. Let's talk about the mark of the beast for a minute, this number 666. But to get to it, to understand it, we need to understand the beast of the sea is political powers and nations that have fallen away from the umbrella and the canopy of God's sovereignty and God's grace. The beast of the earth is religious powers and institutions that compel people to put their trust in those political powers and institutions. 
Here's what this second beast does. Revelation 13, verse 16 through 18. This beast causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is in the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. So there's a mark on people. What is John getting at here? Remember, I've been preparing you for this moment for months. You didn't know it. I didn't know it, to tell you the truth. I was saying something months ago. I'm like, this might point to this, and it absolutely did. About two months ago, we began the seven seals of the scroll in the throne room, and Jesus being the lamb that was worthy to open the scrolls. And as the scrolls are opened, or as the scroll is opened and the seven seals are unsealed, all of a sudden God's judgments and God's wrath begin playing out on earth. And remember, the seals and the trumpets are God's wrath that aren't just condemning sin, they're also calling mankind to repentance. This is also God's mercy at play, calling people, you see the judgment, you see the wrath of God, I want to repent before it's too late. This is God's mercy. In the seventh seal, between the sixth and seventh seal, do you remember the camera zooming out and going to a different location? Between these two seals, all of a sudden, we're brought to a cave on the side of a mountain. And inside this mountain are all of these people that are hiding out. There's kings, there's leaders, there's rulers, there's slaves, there's free people, representing every kind of person that you can imagine is hiding out in this cave. And they're looking at the wrath of God. They're looking at the destruction going on in the planet. And they have one simple question. Do you remember the question? Who can stand? If it's going to be this bad out there, who can stand? And they're actually praying, kill me. Like, it's so bad out there. I'd rather be dead than walk through this. And they're screaming out to God, God, if, this, if your wrath is coming on us, who can stand? And God answers this question through Revelation chapter 6 and 7. Long story short, who can stand in the midst of the tribulation of God? Do you remember? Those that have been marked by the lamb on their foreheads, those that have the mark of the lamb. That mark is 777, whatever that mark is. We talked about what a mark looks like, that it wasn't a physical mark, that it's the characteristic, the attitude, the heart of the lamb of God, of Jesus. So the mark doesn't begin in Revelation 13 with the beast. The mark begins all the way back in chapter six and seven with the mark of Christ on those that are his that God protects during and through the tribulation. Okay, so this is where the mark of Jesus comes. Now, what does the unholy trinity do? They do what with the holy trinity? They mimic it. They can't create. They are not creators. They mimic that which is good and pass it off as good. So the original mark was the mark of Christ. I'm characterized by him. I have the fruit of Christ. I live like him. I have him marked over my entire identity. This is whose who's I am and who I am in him. And the beast comes along and goes, that's a pretty good idea. You know what I'll make? I'll make my own mark, the mark of the beast. In all of mankind, we had no clue that there was a mark of Jesus, but we sure as heck knew there was a mark of the beast. He's deceived us to not see the original thing. So he mimics, and this is what's going on in this entire thing. So who can stand those that are marked by Jesus? And then he comes along with this mimicking device and says, this is my characteristic, this is my trait, this is who I am in all of this. But what about 666? What about this number? And I'm so glad you asked, so let's talk about it, let's go with this. There are three different theories, okay? Three different theories on what the number 666 means. We're gonna cover two of them because one of them is so absurd, it's not even worth our time, okay? One of them is so ridiculous that it's just, it's silly. You can, you can look it up. It's known as the triangular number approach. I, th I think it's just so far stretched that just not, you can look it up. It's, you really have to stretch it for this to be it. But there are two theories about what the number 666 means and what, wh how it belongs in scripture. And, and can I tell you the truth? I think this is one of those times in scripture where it's not and or, or, or either or. I think it's both and. I think these two can actually work together. Okay, so stick with me. Where do we get this number 666 from? What does it mean? Theory number one is a term called gematria. And you might have heard of this in school. Gematria is using numbers to spell words, particularly names. Okay, it's kind of like decoding. Here, here's, some number, or here's some numbers, and you can translate these numbers into letters that ultimately 
say out names. It's where we get the word geometry. So in the first century, it's not a common place yet for numerals. So letters of the alphabet were often used as numerals. So I'm going to show you how this plays out. So if this was written in English, okay? If it was English and it had an alphabet of the day, this is what the numbering system would have looked like. So Leilani, Leilani you can pull this up. A is one, okay? So if you want to say, I'm number one, you're going to say, I'm letter A or I'm number A. B2, C3, D4, all the way to J10, okay? So one through 10 is A through J. When you get to the, so 11 would be JA. So if you're trying to Put the letters together. You need the number 11, J-A. If you're looking for 12, it's J-B. And then when you get to K, it's 20, L-30, M-40. When you get to R, R is 90, S is 100, T is... T you get it? To a degree, you get it? So these, num or these letters represent numbers. The practice of gematria was widespread in the first century. This is something that everybody was doing. For example, my daughter was in Pompeii, Italy recently. In Pompeii, there's, in a cave, there was a sentence found where somebody wrote on a wall, kind of the way we do in public bathrooms on the stalls, right? I love her whose number is 545. What does that mean? Somebody lives in the area code 54? No, it's like somebody's name 545 is unraveled and spells out her name 545. Okay, so Gematria says that the number 666 represents a specific person's name. Who is this? I mean, is this the Antichrist? Is this the beast, just a beast? Who is this 666? Well, it's fascinating. When you hear the list of names who, when transposed with Gematria, equals 666, it's mind-blowing. Let's start with this. The emperor of the time, the Roman emperor who has murdered thousands and thousands of Christians, his name was Emperor Domitian, Grammatically, or grammatically, gram, in Grammatia, his number is 666. The prophet Muhammad of Islam, 666. Napoleon, 666. Stalin, 666. Hitler, 666. There's a couple shocking ones. Martin Luther, the reformer, not Martin Luther King Jr., but the, the reformer of the 16th century, 666. Roosevelt, 666. Henry Kissinger, 666. But the one that mattered to the first century church, Emperor Nero, 666. So Nero is proposed more, most often, and I think for good reason. He is one of the most bestial of all emperor, emperors, and if you do the gematria of his name in Hebrew, it still comes out to 666. So whether you do his name in Greek or you do his name in Hebrew, 666. So this might be what's going on here. They're talking about Nero, maybe. This might be what they're talking about. Now, if you're like me, you hear this, isn't there a little bit of a part of you that's going right now, I want to know what my name is? <laughs> Anybody going, what number is, what number is my name? What, hey, Steve Mon, what, what's your number, right? Zach Lubeck, what's your, Priscilla, what's your number? As soon as I read this, I did my name. And I start going through it, and I start going through Rob Duford and the Grammatica, Grammatia, and the very first number is six. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, what are the chances? So I'm like, oh, no. Then I get to the next number, and it's one. And the third number is six. Ladies and gentlemen, that was close, <laughs> right? That's like playing the slot machines, and you almost got it. I'm like, 616, not 666, praise God. And then I read a book by Daryl Johnson, the main book that's governing us through this series. And he has this quote, interestingly enough, if you take his Latin name, not his Greek name, Nero Caesar, and transliterate it into Hebrew, it comes out to 616. We have a number of ancient manuscripts of Revelation that read 616 instead of 666. You'd take that for what it means. I thought I was off the, off the hook with 616, but apparently not. So whatever that means. So in all of this, now, do you have to stretch it? Maybe, maybe. Or it says here in Revelation 13, hey, you do the calculations, you figure out the number, use wisdom in calculating this number. It very much could be pointing to Nero or the political power so that as the future comes along, you're looking for somebody like that. It very much could be that. That's theory number one. Theory number two. I lean a little bit harder into theory number two, but I am not at all discounting theory number one. Theory number two is 666 is just a symbol. If you've been with me throughout this entire series, all 26 sermons, by now you should know that's where I stand with the imagery and the numbers of this book. A thousand is a symbol, seven is a symbol, they all point to something. 
So if you've been paying attention throughout this, you know this is where we stand. It's not necessarily a code to be broken. It's just standing for something. Let me read Revelation 13, verse 17 and 18. And I want you to underline one particular phrase at the very end. It says this, so that this beast, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. Now underline this, this little section, for it is the number of a man. For it is the number of a man, and this man's number, his number, is 666. It literally says here, for it is the number of a man. Now, let me teach you some Greek. I love to teach you Greek because this is going back to the original language the New Testament was written in. What we have with the ESV, the NIV, the King James Version are all these English translations of the original Greek. And when there's translations to be made, it's tricky. It's not easy. Because Greek is written differently than English. The order is different. The ending is different. A lot of the plurality is different. It's it's not a confusing language, but it is if you don't know it. So I want to show you the Greek of this sentence for a minute. So we're going to pull this up. What this says is arithmus gar anthropu estin. Okay? Anthropus gar anthropu estin. There's two words in here that are common in English. The very first one is arithmus, arithmetic. Numbers. The second one is that third word, anthropu, anthropology, anthropologist, the study of man. Okay, so Greek bring, being brought into English. Now, what we learn here, out of order in English, again, this is in Greek, this is what it says number for man's it is. What does that sound like? Yoda, right? It totally is Yoda. Number for man's it is. Now, here's how it is if we organize this into the proper order, the sentence should be, for it is man's number. For it is man's number. Lock that in your head. For it is man's number. Now go back. What did the ESV just say? And the ESV to me is one of the best translations. But the ESV interprets for it is man's number as for it is the number of a man. Is there a difference? For it is man's number, for it is the number of a man. There's a huge difference, ladies and gentlemen. In the Greek, there's no article. Go with me back to grammar school, right? Into your English classes. What's an article? The definite article is the word the. An indefinite article is the word a or an. This is the donkey. This is a donkey. Pointing at a specific donkey, right? But if we just say this is donkeys, or these are donkeys, we're, we're talking about donkeys, We're not talking about a specific one. So the Greek of this is not, it is the number of a man. It is is man's number. It is man's number. There's neither here. There's no article here. It's the number of man. It's the number of humankind. This means the beast number is not a number assigned to a specific human or a specific beast for that matter, but it's a human number, an analogy. It's like John is saying, this beast is a superhuman force, but if I had to give it a human number, I would give it the number 666. And here's why. You ready? Why 666? Why would this beast get this particular number? Remember, we've been preparing you for this moment. All throughout the book of Revelation, numbers stand for something. The number two stands for a witness. You need two or three witnesses where two or more are gathered in my name. There I will be. We need two. Three, seven, 10, 12, 144 all mean what? Complete, whole, full. But the number seven, the number seven is at the heart of everything in the book of Revelation. Matter of fact, it's in the heart of the entire scripture. Seven is this complete number. It means absolutely, fully, entirely complete. In the book of Revelation, notice this. These are the sevens of the book of Revelation. Seven lampstands, seven churches, seven letters to the seven churches, seven spirits of God, which remember from week one, equal and mean one complete Holy Spirit. There's not seven Holy Spirits, there's one, but he says there's seven spirits of God to show us that there's one complete Holy Spirit. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven thunders, seven heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven hills, seven kings. You get the picture? Seven is a really important Number, what does seven mean in scripture? Complete, full, entirety. Seven equals complete. Got it locked in? Now I have a very important question for you that's gonna unveil everything. You ready? This is a really important question. What is the number six in relation to the number seven? 
less than, right? Six is less than seven. Six is less than complete. It's almost there, but it falls just short. It's like it wants to be seven, but it quite can't get there. So it mimics seven. It pretends to be full and complete, but it's not. The Jewish rabbis of the day considered the number six as the number of incompleteness. So seven represents complete, six represents incomplete. Think about this at creation. It wasn't until the seventh day that God looked at his creation and said, it's done. Now, it's just good, but now we're done. At the sixth day, close, almost done, but God needed to rest. And once he rested, it was completely complete. Remember, the Holy Spirit of God, seven spirits, completely, entirely the Spirit of God. So the beast of the earth mimics the Holy Spirit, but he can't quite measure up. He falls just a little bit short. And the beast from the earth, all the best, he, the best the beast of the earth can do is the number six. And by the way, I think God's being pretty generous giving him a six. I think he's a lot further from seven than that. But he's making a point. The best religion can do for the world is six. So six is the number of incompleteness. Now here's the beauty of it. Why three sixes? Why not just one six? Because three is the number, another number of completeness and the Trinity. Three numbers of completeness of an incomplete and inferior being that's mimicking the real God. So this beast, this unholy Trinity is completely and entirely incomplete. Does that make sense? Where God, 777, is absolutely entirely sufficient and complete, this mimicking creature, this mimicking thing, the beast is completely Incomplete. And for that matter, the Holy Spirit is completely complete. His number should be 777. So we spend so much time focused on this mystical, mythical number of 666. We forget that the primary number is 777. We've been marked by God. We are Jesus's. We are children of the Lamb. But we spend so much time focused on this mystical number of 666 when all it means at the end of the day, nothing more than the fact that Satan is a loser. He is completely and entirely incomplete. He's insufficient. But our God is sufficient. He's all we ever need. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all time, you may abound in every good work. 666, completely incomplete, always falling short of the glory of God. The purpose of the number is not to identify the beast. Who is it? I wonder who it is. But to expose his character and what he's trying to do. John is saying that like the state, religion is also fundamentally, religion that's toxic is also fundamentally opposed to the grace of God. So in the face of this, what do we do? Three quick things. What, what do we do in the face of a false prophet that is trying to get us to worship something that is not our God? What do we do? An in superior or in, inferior product, by the way, something that can't get the job done. What do we do? First of all, health, have a healthy suspicion of the spectacular. Rob, you've lost it. I knew you were 616. Have, have, have a healthy suspicion of the spect spectacular. Ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't mean I don't believe in the supernatural. Absolutely I do. That doesn't believe I don't believe in, the, in mir miracles or the miraculous. I want God to do miracles. Matter of fact, I wrote it down here. The greatest miracle of my entire life is that this loving and complete, entirely complete God of the universe sent his son to die a sinner's death for a despicable sinner like me. That's a miracle. Let's not overlook that. That in itself is a miracle. And not only that, but the miracle lies in the fact that he breathed life into this dead soul of mine. But I want you to understand, not all glitter is gold. Remember, the beast of the earth through the power of the dragon can perform signs and wonders. When we see the miraculous, we have two questions. What is the origin of this? Is this from heaven or is this from the pits of hell? And secondly, what is the goal? What is this miracle pointed to? And the reason I have to say this is because how much of our religion of the past 50 years has been people on stage trying to perform miracles to make much of the person on stage and not much of the king of kings. Anything that's stage-driven that makes much of the person on stage is demonic and from that beast. But God can do miracles. He can heal relationships. He can heal broken bodies. He can destroy cancer, absolutely. But the glory doesn't go to us for receiving it. The glory goes to the king. So have a healthy suspicion of the spectacular. Not just have a suspicion of the spectacular, have a healthy suspicion. Number two, remember that religion does and can 
lose its way. We know that political institutions lose their way, so do religious institutions. Religious institutions lose their way because they put their trust and power not in the living God. They believe they can save and heal the world themselves. It's subtle, it's subtle. I can't tell you how many preachers over the last, it's really the last eight years, but in the last three, all the way back to 2020, I've heard over the years just say, America is the world's greatest and last hope. You, you see the blasphemy in that, right? Ladies and gentlemen, America is not the hope of the world. I love my country, but America is not the greatest nor the final hope. There's one king who holds that name, and that is Jesus. He is our king. Our political allegiance ultimately lies in him, not in our political party. So when religion loses its way, it worships power. It seeks salvation in human systems rather than the grace of God in Christ. So have a healthy suspicion of the spectacular. Remember that we can, religion can lose its way. And finally, worship what we did this morning. Let's worship. The first half of Revelation calls us to worship in the face of these political powers that have gone astray. The second half of Revelation 13 calls us to worship in the face of religious powers that have gone astray. Why would you ever want to worship one who is completely and entirely incomplete? Don't you want to worship the only one who is completely complete? False prophets. At the end of the day, this beast is a false prophet trying to get us to believe anything that isn't true, to buy into something that is counterfeit. How do, how, how do we determine what is fake and what is real? How in our lives do we look at this world and go, ooh, that's real, that's fake? How, how, do, we, how do we discover counterfeits? Well, let's take our lesson from the banking industry. And, and Tuck, you can co go ahead, brother. Um, how do we, let's take our cues from the banking industry. The banking industry, the tellers at your local bank have been trained in how to decipher currency that is real and counterfeit currency. What, what do you think they do to train these employees? Do you think they sit them down in a room and say, hey, here's all the counterfeits. Feel them, smell them, look at them, just study them, memorize all the counterfeits that we have here, even though they don't have access to all the counterfeit money that's accessible. What do they do to train their tellers how to determine what is counterfeit and what is real? They teach them to study what is real. The more you study what is real, you play with that money, you feel that money, you smell that money, you look at that money, you examine that money, you know the marks of that money, that currency. When something that is fake comes along, you're like, I don't know what's wrong with that, but it ain't this. So our object or our, our objective as Christians, let's not just study all the ways of Satan and all the ways that are false. Let's worship the one that is true. The closer, the more we dive into his word, the closer we are in community of faith as a church in the church, the closer we come to the heart of the Father, the more we know him. Then when a false prophet arises and says all these foolish things, whether in private or from stage, we're like, that ain't right. I don't quite know what it is, but that is not right. And then we don't fall for the traps of this beast. We don't start worshiping something that isn't the completely complete God of the universe. We don't fall for the completely incomplete one. We worship the completely complete one. If you take Jesus' name in Greek, it's Iesus. I love it. It's just a more fun name to say, Iesus, okay? It's spelled like this, and so we're gonna look at the grammatica of it. It's spelled iota or iota. That's an I in Greek like as small as an iota, okay? So in, in the Grammatica, it's worth 10 points. The eta is the EI combination of English. Some of you guys are doing the math. Don't do the math. Wait for the punchline. The third letter is the sigma, which is an S. The omicron is an O, worth 70 points. The upsilon, which is a U, is 400 points. And again, we see the sigma, the S, worth 200 points. You total the number up grammatic in the Grammatica of Jesus' Greek name, and you get the number 888. 888. If 666 is completely incomplete and 777 is completely complete and Jesus is 888, it's like an over-the-top message that this is who Jesus is. Religion 666 is failure upon failure upon failure, but Jesus 888 never fails, never fails, never fails. He alone is the world's last and great hope. So instead of focusing all upon this mark of the beast, this number. Yes, we need to be aware of evil. We need to know what Satan is up to. 
but our eyes, our focus, our allegiance goes to the completely complete one. The one that we were marked by. First and foremost, chapters before this mark of the beast is exposed, we are exposed to the mark of the lamb. This is who we worship. So Satan's going after you. He's going after your stuff. He's going after your kids. He's going after your marriage. He's going after your health. Remind him, listen, we're in the already, but not yet. We're in this space between the incar- the, the ascension of Jesus Christ and the final coming, the perusia of Jesus Christ. This, I know what you're doing, Satan. I know you're trying to distract me. I know you're trying to get my eyes on other hopes. I'm going to put my hope in institutions and in political powers. I, I see your ways. I don't see your ways because I've been studying your ways. I see your ways because I've been studying my king. I worship my king and I know who is real. And because of that, I'm going to choose the harder, more difficult path because I know it's the right path. I'm not gonna fall for your trap here. I'm going to worship my king. I'm gonna stay true to my king. I'm not gonna fall for your ways. Let me, bow, let me pray for you this morning. Here's my heart for today and this morning. This isn't just, oh, let's go home and we've learned what 666 means. No, this is, what, what is God doing in our hearts in this moment? My prayer is that in this moment, the Holy Spirit would do his work where you'd be humble enough. Like this takes some true humility to look into our hearts and go, Lord, where are those places that I've been deceived? What are those areas that I've gravitated to that the false prophet of religion has spoken to me? What are the idols of my heart? Where have I been putting my hope in counterfeit, incomplete things? This morning, I turn from them. I repent of them. I present them to you at the foot of your cross. It's the completely complete one. So Jesus, I pray for your mercy in this room. As we read, you are all sufficient. You have all grace all the time. And so we approach you boldly this morning and ask for mercy in our lives for those places in our hearts where we've worshiped this beast. We followed a trail that we shouldn't follow We've gone to places and idols that we shouldn't have gone. But today, on this Lord's Day, August 13th, 2023, we turn to you. We have been marked by you. We are owned and possessed by you, a good, good God. So forgive us, Lord, for following the idol of religion, the idol of politics and parties, these things that you instituted for our good, but Satan has turned to try to deceive us with them. I pray that you will humble our hearts today to turn towards you, to bring our sin into the light so you can deal with it. We love you, our creator, our king. It's in your name we pray, amen. Now let's stand and let's sing this chorus real quickly and declare the truth of this.